So just kind of work with us. It's a lot like the gorilla campaign. You know, you've got to wait for the right minute. Um, please make sure that you visit um, the lovely folks in the back. I see Jim Pike is back there, Eric Mason. Um, Kim is back there. We've got um, Chris Swagger's book. I don't know, Bill, did you bring your books? He is not. Patrick O'Kelly is going to um, have his new work, uh, Mary and Orderly book. Steve Smith will be here with us tomorrow. Um, let's talk about Christine Swagger. She's got her stuff out there. Fabulous. Thank you for doing that. Um, am I missing anybody in the back? Please take a moment to go back and visit them. They've got some great material back there. Um, if you are on social media, just check us out. Have a selfie. Um, our marketing folks are in the back. I was thinking how funny that would be if all of us had a selfie, but I'll refrain from doing that right now. <laughs> we'll do that later after we have dinner. Um, I'm pleased to have um, the SC250 marketing team with us, so please introduce yourselves. And that reminds me, this is gonna be the most awkward moment of the day. Not really, but it'll be the first awkward moment. How many of you are new? Is this your first time here? Yeah. Okay, for all the oldies and goodies, make sure you uh, reach out to one of those folks, welcome them, bring them into our fold, and we're so excited that y'all are here. Thank you very much for coming. If there's anything that we can do to make this better for you, please let us know. Like I said, um, if your flight attendants, just ring your little bell, we'll be happy to help you. Um, there will be a test at the end. Um, I always got on JD last year about that. Um, there will be a test after each presentation, so please take notes. Those are provided for you in your booklet. And then um, we can have a great time. So tonight, make sure you're back here. Uh, Zach Lenhouse, who's a great friend of the SA 250 and is also working on the Thomas Sumter papers, is going to be um, using his fiddle to entertain us tonight. And that is a lot of fun. You are not here to hear me. So without further ado, let's kick off the 21st Francis Marion Symposium with our first speaker, Mr. Al Truesdale, Francis Marion, the Huguenots, and the Spirit of Capitalism. Please welcome Al. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Consideration of Francis Marion is incomplete without paying attention to his French Protestant heritage. It stamped his private and public character. The South Carolina Huguenots and other Huguenot settlers in America were refugees from the religious persecution in France. They were part of a much larger diaspora that spread to numerous parts of the world. Huguenots, a derogatory term in France, were a people largely shaped by Calvinism, a form of 19th century European Protestantism authored by John Calvin. The study of the Huguenots includes discussing what German sociologist and historian Max Weber, 1864-1920, said about their role in developing modern capitalism. This paper examines that role. In approximately 1682, Francis Marion's French Protestant Huguenot grandfather, Benjamin Marion left France as part of a wider exodus known as Le Refuge. He was in England by September 1686, when, along with Judith and Madeleine Value and Marie Nicholas, he was reprimanded by the consistory of the French Church of London for having abjured their religion, and having gone to Mass, I don't know why, either before leaving England or after arriving in Carolina, Benjamin married Judith Valuet. In 
1694, <clears throat> Benjamin's name first appears in South Carolina records. A January 1694 assessment of Goose Creek, Goose Creek inhabitants, lists Marion as a property owner. He had imported seven persons, including his, his wife, and have been, had been granted 350 acres. <clears throat> Lying behind Benjamin abandoning France was the Counter-Reformation, or the Catholic Reformation as it is also known, the French Wars of Religion, and the two-month-long Bartholomew's Day Massacre. The latter involved widespread slaughter of Huguenots by Catholics. Marion probably left France before the 1685 Edict of Revocation, or the Edict of Fountain Blue, which ended the 1598 Edict of Nantes. <clears throat> Nantes had freed Protestant prisoners and given Huguenots substantial rights and protections. By persecuting and evicting the Huguenots, France lost many of its most industrious citizens. The 1896 issue of the Atlantic maintains that in France, the Huguenots had formed the most intelligent and energetic class of the French nation. James G. Harrison adds, they were drawn from the wealthy French middle class and from the provincial nobility. <clears throat> Huguenot migration from South Carolina began in 1680 with the arrival of the Richmond in Charleston, carrying 45 persons. A second ship, the Margaret, arrived in 1685 with 50 or so Huguenots aboard. Huguenots came as families or as individuals. Many escaped France with no more than, than their lives. Many of them needed financial assistance from the Crown and from the Church of England. Some indentured themselves in payment for passage. Often, often, they struggle against famine and fever. Huguenot migration to Carolina resulted from intense recruitment by the Lord's proprietors. They wanted Carolina settled for the lowest cost and to promote production that would support lucrative trade. <clears throat> they sponsored 15 promotional tracts which projected an Edenic image of Carolina. The pamphlets promised economic opportunities, freedom of conscience, and free and easy naturalization. During the proprietary period, 1665-1719, individual Huguenots settled throughout the Carolina Low Country. Most of them congregated in four district, four district communities, Charleston, Orange Quarter, Goose Creek in Ber Berkeley County, and Santee in Craven County. Some Huguenots remained in Charleston and flourished. But most of them moved north and east along the eastern branches of the Cooper River. From there, they moved to vacant lands along the Santee River, also known as the French Santee, where they became planters in one of the richest rice-growing parts of South Carolina. <clears throat> you cannot material success. Having warned us not to mythologize Huguenot economic success in Carolina, Bertrand Van Ramvicki subtitles his chapter on land, trade, and slaves as From Rags to Riches in Colonial South Carolina. <clears throat> the proprietary venture in Carolina was a serious commercial effort meant to improve England's balance of trade. The prevailing policy of the time was mercantilism, 
referred to as balance of trade theory. In theory, Huguenot immigrants were to produce semi-tropical products whose trade would enrich England. Reputedly, Huguenots were exports, experts in making wine and silk and growing fruit, which supposedly made them excellent potential mercantile colonists. Huguenot economic life in proprietary Carolina is intriguing. <clears throat> the 1680s, the experimental period, Huguenots attempted to satisfy the Lord's proprietor's mercantile goals. They tried to make wine, silk, and perhaps even olive oil. They engaged in subsistence farming with diverse crops, seeking a source for lucrative export, exports. But, says Rambini, Huguenots did not cross the Atlantic to pursue proprietary pipe dreams. Instead, <clears throat> they came in pursuit of whatever economic activity would guarantee their economic well-being and prosperity. <clears throat> the 1690s, Huguenots ceased pursuing the, proprietor, the proprietor's dreams. They engaged in livestock raising, which required little expertise and minimal investment. They sought to accumulate enough capital to purchase slaves and acquire more land. At the turn of the century, the wealthiest Huguenots had successfully experimented with rice production. Those for whom lucrative rice production was not possible stuck to ranching, stuck to ranching and grain production. They sold their crops locally and to Charleston merchants, not principally to England, as mercantilism had intended. Merchants and artisans who acquired town lots continued practice of their pre-migratory occupation. The 1690s, merchants conducted small trade in in provisions and wood with the Caribbean and Northern American colonies. Artisans enjoyed success in, Ch in Charleston because of a scarcity of craftsmen. Once merchants gained sufficient capital, they traded with Huguenots and non-Huguenots associates in Charleston and London. For the Huguenots, land was Carolina go, a quasi-boundless appetite the Lord proprietors constantly sought to satisfy. So the Lord proprietors' mercantilist hopes came to nothing. A failure they acutely observed. <clears throat> Rene LeHugh Marshall, a Marshall, senior researcher of the Huguenot Society of South Carolina, notes that Huguenot economic opportunities were not unique to the Huguenots. They simply worked creatively within the global economy and imperialism of the era. Max Weber is ready to explain <coughs> Huguenot economic success. <clears throat> So Max Weber and the Huguenots. If Weber is correct, the Carolina Huguenots who rejected mercantilism should be seen as early bourgeois capitalists, a phenomenon rooted not only in their native abilities, but more definitively in the form of Protestant theology they practiced, and the economic ethic it fostered. More broadly, Huguenot theology provides the key for understanding the birth, according to Weber, of modern capitalism. 
Weber's substantial argument appears in his classic, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, 1904. Capitalism, Weber said, is identical with the pursuit of profit and forever renewed profit by means of continuous, rational, capitalistic enterprise. Weber's thesis is this, that in its first major iteration, capitalism was birthed by capitalism. You repeat just that. <clears throat> Weber's thesis that it is that in its first major iteration, capitalism was birthed by Calvinism. Explaining this requires showing the relationship between the spirit of modern economic life, capitalism, and the rational ethic of ascetic Protestantism. So, Huguenot theological identity. <clears throat> As noted earlier, the Huguenots were Calvinists, or Reformed. A.J. Grant observes that Huguenots embraced with enthusiasm the hopes and disciplines of Calvinism. It was their real driving power. Max Weber agrees. Calvinist piety penetrated and dominated their whole lives. Four reformed doctrines form the basis for Weber's thesis, and I want to explore those. <clears throat> First, the absolute sovereignty of God, who is to be worshipped without any equivocation. God says Calvin claims omnipotence for himself and would have us acknowledge the same. The world is so governed by the secret counsel of God that nothing happens but that he has knowingly and willingly decreed it. The world, yes, with me? Oh, I'm so sorry. Go back to point one. <laughs> go back to Huguenot theological identity, okay? <clears throat> As noted earlier, the Huguenots were Calvinists, or Reformed. A.J. Grant observes that Huguenots embraced with enthusiasm the hopes and disciplines of Calvinism. It was their real driving power. Max Weber agrees, Calvinist piety penetrated and dominated their whole lives. Four Reformed doctrines form the basis for Weber's thesis. First, the absolute sovereignty of God, who is to be worshipped without any equivocation. God, says Calvin, claims omnipotence for himself and would have us acknowledge it. The world is so governed by the secret counsel of God that nothing happens but that it has knowingly and willingly been decreed by him. The world and humans exist only to glorify God. God is complete in himself. He has no need of us. Second, partially deriving from the first affirmation is the doctrine of predestination. Blessed predestination. God neither creates nor redeems on equal terms. From eternity, by his select counsel, God chooses whom he will while he rejects others. Owing to the mere pleasure of God that some people are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. Moreover, all whom God predestines to salvation, he will irresistibly, effectually call. 
the elect are brought by calling into the fold of Christ according as God sees it meet to dispense his grace. Quoting Calvin. <clears throat> as confirmed Calvinists, humbly, Huguenots faced life with the certainty offered by predestination. They knew themselves to be chosen of God in a war where victory was certain. According to Weber, an ethic largely grounded in predestination became a source of confidence and the springboard of capitalism. Third, <clears throat> central to Calvinist or Reformed theology is the doctrine of covenant. A series of divine covenants unify the teachings of the Bible. As revealed there, covenants made between God and humankind provided what was needed at, spe at specific stages of revelation. The covenant of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or the covenant of life, or the covenant of eternal life, is the consonant covenant. It was not preached equally to all. Only those elected to salvation are members of the covenant of the gospel. Fourth, closely associated with these doctrines is the concept of calling or vocation. God appoints each Christian to some calling. The Lord, Calvin taught, enjoins every one of us in all the actions of life to have respect to our own calling. Calling is not to be confused with the station in life to which a person is born. In addition to fulfilling one's personal assignment, divine calling promotes orderly social structure. By fulfilling one's call, a Christian serves the mundane life of the community. Obedience to calling became a motivating element of the Huguenot ethic. Now, <clears throat> holy alliance, piety, and wealth. We are probably wondering how is it possible, so far as one's own state of grace was concerned, to become convinced that he or she was among the elect. Part of the answer, by Weber's account, revealed, reveals the original spirit of capitalism. It is one's responsibility to know himself, or herself, herself, as being among, among the elect, and to combat all Doubts as temptations coming from Satan himself. The Apostle Peter had exhorted Christians to make their calling and election sure. Weber concentrated on an additional and objective Calvinist criterion for securing certitude of election. A unique form of worldly asceticism which involves purposefully ordering God's creation. One demonstrates or confirms one's faith in a type of worldly activity that yields, I quote, a systematic, rational ordering of the moral life as a whole. It entails a rational Christianization of all of life. For Calvinists, they, they were believed, Worldly Protestant asceticism was the most suitable means for counteracting feelings of religious uncertainty. <clears throat> only, only the elect are able by virtue of their new birth, regeneration, to, glory, to glorify God through divinely ordered and empowered works. Read that. Only the elect <clears throat> are able by virtue of their new birth to glorify God through divinely ordered and empowered works. Never 
Are such works to be viewed as benefiting oneself or as contributing to one's salvation? Always. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. Worldly asceticism necessitates diligence, thrift, sobriety, and a prudent stewardship of entrusted resources, including one's wealth. With reference to one's possessions, for the glory of God, a restless effort, in, in restless effort, one sub subordinates oneself as, as an obedient steward or even as an acquisitive machine. Such a diligent ethic promotes acquisition as testimony to election and obedience to calling. Let me repeat that key. For such a diligent ethic, su such a diligent ethic promotes acquisition as testimony to election and obedience to call it. <clears throat> Once this ascetic compulsion to save and the attendant limitation of consumption are combined with a compounding release of additional acquisitive activity, the inevitable practical result is an accumulation of capital, which then makes possible or necessary a rationally productive investment of capital. Although pursuing wealth as an in itself or spontaneously enjoying one's possessions is reprehensible, obtaining wealth as a result of labor in one's calling is a sign of God's blessing, a sure confirmation of election. Here, in a theologically grounded asceticism, we encounter the dynamic that birthed capitalism as a rational deployment of capital. <clears throat> the Huguenots embodied and demonstrated this spirit. They and their fellow Calvinists had brought to this had been brought to this place by a religion that taught them to regard the pursuit of wealth as not merely an advantage, but a duty. A halo of sanctification had been placed upon the pursuit of wealth. Conscious of standing in the fullness of God's grace and being visibly blessed by Him, as long as the Huguenot capitalist remain within the bounds of formal correctness as long as his moral conduct was spotless and the use to which he put his wealth was not objectionable, he could pursue his pecuniary interest certain that, his fully, that he was fulfilling a divine duty, a divine calling. He could be comfortably assured that the unequal distribution of this world's goods was a special dispensation of divine providence. In religion and the rise of capitalism, Harvard professor of political economy, Benjamin Friedman, notes that over time, the religious values that gave rise to the mode of thought and behavior labor attributed to predestinarian Calvinism and other forms of ascetic Protestantism outlived the religious foundation that gave rise to them. Foundations that gave rise to them. The original premise evolved into a more general moral appreciation of the Protestant forms of behavior, separate from any specific content and freewheeling form uh, and freewheeling and free I'm sorry and freestanding form back up the original premise evolved into a more general moral appropriation of the Protestant forms of behavior separate from any specific content and freestanding from any theological basis in other words 
capitalism eventually became secularized, not theological. <clears throat> well, my conclusion. In spite of Weber's impressive treatment of the historical, phenom the historical phenomenon, I am left with two conclusions, one certain and one marked by reservation. First, while I do not question the way Weber unfolded the Calvinist economic ethic, he seriously misrepresented what John Calvin taught regarding how one knows that he or she is among, is among the elect. Relying upon the Apostle Paul, Calvin stressed the convincing testimony of the Holy Spirit. He taught a secret efficiency of the Spirit to which, it is, to which it is owing that we enjoy Christ and all his blessings. Second, I have a strong impression that as Weber's thesis pertains to the Carolina Huguenots, his case is far more inferential than substantive and demonstrable. Rambicki recognizes that Huguenot settlers were bent on securing as much wealth as possible in its, in its least volatile form, namely real estate. But he says, most of what is needed to account for Huguenot economic su success is common sense. Nevertheless, I am haunted by the possibility that Weber has correctly explained Huguenot economic success and has correctly identified the Calvinistic diaspora as the real sealed seedbed of capitalistic economy. And so, after working with this topic, for this period of time, I'm with the, I'm left with the conclusion, I don't know. <laughs> focuses on Huguenots in South Carolina, but it seems to me the English were just as capitalistic in their approaches as Weber is saying Huguenots are. And do you have a sense of, is there a difference between the two? I think, I think the answer lies in the concept of mercantilism. I know that seems to disagree with what you're saying. But the, according to Van Vicky and others, the, the Huguenots rejected mercantilism in a way that the French, that the English did not. Um, eventually that mercantilist philosophy is rejected, generally. But um, at least in favor, argues um, is far more applicable to a strict Calvinist uh, context than it was true than was true of the Anglican context. Recognizing that that with the Anglican context you also have a reformed or Calvinist element, but not to the extent that you have with the uh, with the Huguenots. But I I think you're digging digging at the right place. Yeah. There was another question. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I'm a retired agricultural economist, and it's like I listen to your um, presentation uh, closely, and, I, and I, uh, I was very interested in your comments, and I'm certainly not going to contradict anything that you said. But I would like to add a couple of points, and that is that, um, well, the mercantile is system is one of the systems that Adam Smith criticized in his book, Wealth of Nations, that came out the same year as the Declaration of Independence. And one of the unfortunate things about, um, about that is that um, there's a lot of, in a lot of cases, we kind of conflate 
explains the concept of the democracy with capitalism. And they are different things. Capitalism is an economic system. Democracy, or Democrat, democracy is a political system, etc. And as Adam Smith pointed out, without some kind of regulation of the capitalistic system, it doesn't serve the public good very well. And that was reinforced by the Great Depression and the Great Recession. Um, and there's been the, I'm not commenting so much on the connection between religion and economic system, uh, capitalism in the early days, but in the last 50 years or so, there's been this tendency to worship the market almost as if the market is God. And the Great Depression, Great Recession showed that that's not true. And, you know, we would never play the, we never consider having a Super Bowl being played without rules and referees. And yet, this tendency to conflate democracy and capitalism and to attribute all the all the values of democracy to capitalism um, leads us to a pretty unstable economic system that prevents things like people being able to afford health care, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, has its problems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think my, my biggest beef with the vapor. Uh, I'm not a Calvinist, I'm a Wesleyan, and those are two different theological uh, traditions. But uh, Weber didn't do his homework. He just did not. Um, if you read the, uh, the Institutes, the third, the third book, uh, if, if Weber had read Calvin carefully, um, He simply could not have developed the thesis as he did. Uh, Calvin places a much greater emphasis upon the witness of the Holy Spirit than, um, than Weber gave him credit for. So, you know, to work with a topic like this and then conclude um, with as many questions as I have, uh, well, it's fruitful, but it's, it's also somewhat disappointing. <laughs> Thank you.